Welcome back, hackers. Continuing from episode one, we're going to be further breaking down IP addresses, how they govern the internet, and the differences between your local network and the internet as a whole. As usual, I'll be direct and concise to ensure optimal learning. In our previous video, I explained IPv4, IPv6, and how subnets work. We used a gated neighborhood as our example, which we call 192.168.1. This neighborhood can hold 254 houses, as I mentioned, but now we get to go deeper. Recall how the front gate is what permits all of the residents to enter and exit the neighborhood. We call this the gateway, which is a proper networking term for a device that forwards traffic onto its next destination. Now, if you didn't already make the connection, the gateway is just a router in our example. Every one of the 254 houses that belongs to your neighborhood sits behind the router. The residents are basically just network packets going out into the rest of the world, aka the internet. If Sally lives at 192.168.1.13 but needs to visit a website to do some shopping, she's going to get in her car and leave the neighborhood by exiting through the gateway. So why is this important? Just about every device on your router's network is going to communicate with the internet in some way, meaning it is going to initiate connections that pass through the router. But what is the internet? The internet, a vast, uncharted land of rogue servers and false promises. A tool for the most powerful kings to influence their subjects a playground for the eldritch lords to manipulate mankind. Understand now that as a hacker, the most dangerous thing you own that's in your house is your router. But I digress. The internet is just a giant network connecting a bunch of smaller networks together. It is primarily dominated by IPv4 addresses, while IPv6 is still being adopted. But do you remember how IPv4 addresses can reach a maximum of 4.3 billion devices? There are twice as many people than that in the world, and we all tend to have multiple devices. So how do we give IP addresses to all of these devices? Now enters public and private IP addresses. A public IP address is unique across the internet. They are assigned to your router by your ISP, or internet service provider, and are used to identify your home network, or any of the smaller networks that make up the internet. They can be all over the place and look like any of these. When you purchase internet for your home or office, your ISP gives you a router with a public IP address that is all your own. Now we can talk about private IP addresses. Private IP addresses sit behind a public IP address. There are three reserved IP address ranges for private networks, which start with 10, 172, and 192. Does that sound familiar? In our neighborhood example, Sally has the IP address of 192.168.1.13, which is a private IP address given to her house by the neighborhood router. If her neighborhood wanted to rebrand itself and give Sally an address such as 10.0.0.13 or something fancy like 172.16.87.13 instead, it could do so by identifying itself as 10.0.0 or 172.16.87. Sally and her neighbors could communicate very happily within this network so long as it utilizes a reserved private IP address. From your perspective, this is simply changing the IP address range in your router to whichever you prefer. For now, let's stick with the neighborhood's title of 192.168.1. When Sally leaves the neighborhood to go shopping, instead of saying that she is coming from her house at 192.168.1.13, she is going to say that she came from her neighborhood's public IP address, let's say 100.100.100.100 as an example. What's happening here is that the router is replacing Sally's private IP address with its own public IP address, which is a process known as Network Address Translation, or NAT. NAT allows us to have private networks of many different sizes, with many more devices, which can all utilize one public IP address. When Sally goes shopping, the store she visits will see that she is coming from 100.100.100.100. 
When she comes home, the router will route her back to her house at 192.168.1.13. This is important because it allows us to create internal networks capable of holding many more devices. However, from a security perspective, NAT also masks our internal private IP addresses from the public internet, adding a layer of privacy. This helps keep our internal network layout unknown to the rest of the world. So on the inside, all of the residents refer to the neighborhood as 192.168.1, but the rest of the world knows it as 100.100.100.100. I'm sure you understand by now, and it's time to start referring to the more technical nature of these processes. Now we are going to talk about dynamic and static IP addresses. In your private network, you have the ability to choose how IP addresses are given to devices. Dynamic IP addresses are temporarily assigned to a device using a protocol called DHCP, or Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Think about the wording on that for a second. Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Each time a device connects, it requests an IP address from the DHCP server installed on the router. This is the most common setup. Each time you sign into your Wi-Fi or home network with a device, it is given an IP address to communicate with the rest of the network. Sally's house, aka her device, was given 192.168.1.13. Moral of the story, it is dynamically given a private IP address. Dynamic IPs are commonly used for convenience in home networks, while static IPs are better for devices that need to stay reachable at a fixed address, like a server or printer. If Sally turns off her device and connects back to the DHCP-enabled network a couple of days later, her private IP address could be 192.168.1.54.162.22 or whatever the router gives her because it is assigning IPs dynamically. Now, what if we wanted Sally to always have her original address of 192.168.1.13? With a static IP setup, this IP address will stay consistent, helping Sally's device always be reachable at the same address on the private network. Having a static IP means that a device's IP address will not change over time, no matter when it joins back to the network. Static IP addresses are typically assigned to websites, servers, and other public technologies that need the world to know where they consistently are. Also note that both private and public IP addresses can be dynamic or static. There are security advantages and disadvantages to both, which I'll save for another video. From a hacker's perspective, there is a wealth of attacks we can perform against each of them, such as the infamous man in the middle attack. In an attack like this, we can trick a device on the network into thinking that we are the router, then trick the router into thinking that we are the victim's device. From here, you are now in the middle of their connection and can conduct a multitude of operations against the victim. So we know now that devices can be assigned an IP dynamically or statically, but how does the router remember the device when it joins back? Each device must have a piece of hardware known as a network interface card, or NIC as we call it, to join a network. A NIC might be built into your motherboard, installed as a Wi-Fi chip, or something else. Each NIC has a unique identifier known as a MAC address, otherwise called a Media Access Control Address. Each MAC address is like a device's permanent ID on the network, helping routers and switches identify devices even if their IP address changes. The MAC address is permanent for that network card, but we as ethical hackers can use special software to spoof, aka change, a MAC address. MAC address spoofing allows ethical hackers to assume the identity of another device on the network a useful tactic for simulating certain attacks. When a device connects to a DHCP-enabled network, it broadcasts a DHCP request using its MAC address, which our router uses to identify the device uniquely. Based on this MAC address, the DHCP server assigns an available IP from its IP pool. If we're talking about joining a device to a static network, the administrator of that network must manually add the device by its characteristics, such as its MAC address, desired IP address, subnet mask, and other details. 
This is a major hassle for an administrator, and you will rarely find this setup in the wild or in corporate environments. You may find it in highly secure setups where the owner of the network wants complete control of everything that is connected. Now, there are many attacks we can issue against these systems and protocols, but it is important to remember that many security measures exist to counter our actions as ethical hackers. With a solid understanding of public versus private IPs, NAT, DHCP, and MAC addresses, you're now equipped to understand the basics of network structures and device communication. This foundational knowledge will prepare you for more advanced concepts in future episodes. As usual, like, subscribe, and don't miss out on episodes. Episode 3 coming next week.